people don't see the humanity, especially on, on Twitter and Tumblr, these like faceless platforms where all you're seeing is text for the most part. They get the sense that they're yelling at a celebrity. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest this week is journalist Rebecca Jennings, who writes about social media and internet culture for Vox. A few weeks ago, Rebecca asked Twitter for examples of the most chronically online discourse of 2022. The replies were incredible. A woman who was accused of elitism for tweeting about how much she enjoys drinking coffee with her husband in their garden. Another woman who was attacked as a white savior because she wanted to bring her neighbors chili. A debate about whether telling people to touch grass is ableist or whether Anne Frank had white privilege. Rebecca has some answers. She recently wrote a piece for Vox called Every Chronically Online Conversation is the Same. Here's Rebecca Jennings. Rebecca Jennings, welcome to Offline. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, So about a week ago, I saw a tweet from you that said, all right, folks, it's time. What was the most chronically online discourse you saw this year? Which led to a long thread of replies filled with examples that just shook me to my core, uh, and I'm a I'm a chronically online person. Um, you then ended up writing a fantastic piece about this for Vox, uh, which I want to get to. But just to start, for people who don't know, how would you describe chronically online discourse? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I would describe chronically online discourse as conversations that can only exist between people who have spent way too much time in on Tumblr and or Twitter, and now increasingly TikTok, where a lot of these kind of chronically online discourses are happening. Mm. Um, but you you get a lot of, you know, the, the stereotype is like, okay, I tweeted about like my, you know, my acute thing that I did with my family, maybe. And someone would be like, well, actually, I don't have a family, so how dare you? <laughs> it, it's sort of like have like making a post about something that may not be entirely universal and then having that then having you be this kind of like villain of their personal story. <laughs> because your because your personal experience did not reflect everyone else's uh, experiences <laughs> on Twitter or whatever platform this is happening on. Yes. <laughs> what were the most uh, popular examples that popped up in your uh, worst of 2022 thread? Yeah. Um, I think by by and large, um, the, the, the discourse that has been shortened to just Chili Neighbor became kind of the one that... <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, we have to talk about Chili Neighbor <laughs> because I have to say, again, I'm a chronically online person. I had no... I totally missed the Chili Neighbor oh thing. Oh, my God. And then... <laughs> I went down because of your thread. I went down a rabbit hole, <laughs> and I was just like, "Oh my god!" So please go ahead and tell us what Chili, chili Neighbor is. Sure. So, so there's this woman who did a you know a decently long Twitter thread about how like she lives next door to these kind of like frat bros, I would say, um, who they're constantly ordering food in, like a lot of pizza boxes outside. And she, you know, she was like, I think like a neighborly thing to do would be like make them some chili um, and like leave it on their doorstep or whatever, Um, (laughs) which is like very sweet. How dare she? (laughs) I know. How dare she? Uh, And so basically the replies, like she already had like a pretty big like fan base online. But when once a certain pocket of Twitter or whatever platform you're on finds something like this, it becomes like open season on whoever is around. Um, so she was told that like she was being insensitive to, um, people that may have been autistic and didn't want to deal with the labor of like having to thank her for it. Uh, this, the woman who wrote the thread is autistic, uh, which is, right. you know, which That's part of key the, point. <laughs> yeah, key point. Um, she was told that she was, uh, engaging in like white saviorism. Um, she didn't, I don't think she referenced the race of these frat boys, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> who knows? Um, she was told that, you know, other people have like weird things about cleanliness and how dare, you know, someone bring over something that they didn't know what was um, what was in it or like being presumptuous, essentially like, oh, like people can't feed themselves. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's just very like bastardization of this of this idea that wouldn't be out of place in like a, you know, like portrait of a beautiful socialist like utopia of like we're all making food for each other like how great is that (laughs) yeah like literally nothing more fundamental in terms of (laughs) relationships with other people than to like 
treating thy neighbor as yes. you would like to be treated. Wasn't there yeah. someone who also was like, what if they don't have bowls? Isn't it insensitive <laughs> if they don't have... What if they didn't have bowls? As if she was going to like yeah. walk over there with like chili in her hands. <laughs> Just, like, <laughs> well, what if they ate with their hands? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, what was your what's what's your personal favorite of the last the last year? Oh, my gosh. Um, I think there was this one thread about how this this girl just like randomly tweeted this one thing and it was funny. It was just like, you ever like think, you know, like you see one of your friends and they say they can't cook and you're like, okay, but like, you know, let's cook together. Like it'll be easy. And then you realize that like they literally cannot like chop a tomato. So it's like they really can't do like the bare minimum of cooking. That tweet, it was like a month ago. <laughs> like that tweet was subject to like the most bad faith readings of it. It was sort of like, you know, people with disabilities can't chop food, which is like not what they're talking about. People, you know, weren't given like the time and space growing up to cook. How (laughs) dare you assume that someone knows how to cook and chop their own vegetables and anything like that. And, And she ended up having to like respond to all of these. And you can see like the thread of when she first posted it and she was just like, I'm not going to engage in all this like bullshit replies, like whatever y'all can go crazy in the replies. And then you see her start to actually reply because people were making like really, you know, really harsh judgments on her intentions. And she felt like she had to defend herself. So it was just like this, this complete breakdown of the social contract and her, her having to engage in it. And it was, it was impeccable. (laughs) Chopping tomatoes, both elitist and yes. ableist. Yes, correct. <laughs> okay, I just want to make <laughs> I've sure. learned. <laughs> so there, there are a few levels of awful uh, in these examples to unpack what you do in the piece. So the first is the group of people who pile on the person who shares an experience that may not be entirely universal, right? Yeah. Um, so these are like the initial round of angry replies to the chilly neighbor, um, or or the coffee garden woman. That was another big one. This is where yep. a woman said, I, I love to sit with my husband and drink coffee in, in my in our garden every morning. And everyone was like, what if you don't have a garden? What if you don't have a husband? That's pretty. Le-. Yeah. So that was a bad one, too. Like, who are these people replying and what do you think is going on with them? Like, what is fueling all that rage? So, yeah. So I, I think, you know, doing that Twitter thread, it sort of just like made me feel bad, you know, seeing everyone replying. And then, you know, this has become kind of like a contact sport where it's like, let's see the most chronically online take we can possibly find. And and then like, there's a part of that that is extremely fun and funny and like hilarious. Uh, The other part of it is like, you know, when you think about what kinds of people tweet things like making chili for your neighbors is being like a white savior or being, you know, ableist or elitist or whatever, like you think about what those people are like or what they're doing, like they're spending a lot of time on Twitter tweeting things that like may or may not have any like grounding in reality or context or, you know, just they have, they also have like no business talking about it. Uh, and, you know, there's probably an element of maybe like loneliness and anger and like rightful anger, right? Because it's like the world is ableist and yeah. they're, they're like sexism is everywhere. And, and so is classism and racism and like everything. Uh, And it permeates like every aspect of our culture. But when you think about the type of person that, you know, wants to kind of show their like moral groundedness through little instances of like, like interpersonal instances that do not involve them at all, uh, you're, you're you're like, you're probably not in a, like a logical place of mind or, you know, you're going through something. Yeah. You're going through something, uh, you know, they, they might not have you know, a, a big world outside of their computer. And it just sometimes feels bad to pile on those people, however insane their takes may be. <laughs> I mean, you make the great point that very few people engage in these kinds of arguments offline in real life. Like, if you overheard someone at a party talking about how much they love having coffee with their husband in the garden, like, you wouldn't go tell them. <laughs> their privilege was showing. Right. <laughs> right? Like, like why, why do you think that is? What do you think it is about social media that makes, makes it so easy to pile yeah. on? Yeah. I mean, I think that people don't see the humanity, especially on, on Twitter and Tumblr, these like faceless 
platforms where all you're seeing is text for the most part, you don't grasp the same sense of humanity as you would on like a YouTube video or a TikTok where there's like, Mm -hmm. you know, you feel on TikTok and YouTube, like you're kind of FaceTiming with a friend or you know these people because you know their mannerisms, like you see them physically as another person. Um, Whereas on Twitter, I think especially with people who don't have a lot of followers and they're, and they're piling on someone who does have like more followers than them, they get the sense that they're yelling at a celebrity. And it's like, no, <laughs> like these are normal people. They just happen to have like Twitter followings. Uh, and yeah. you know, they're probably not making money off of that. They're probably just like love to tweet. Um, and so I think there's that element. There's also, you know, this idea that like in the normal world, we have like the natural gatekeepers of time and space to, so like, yeah. To disallow this many people from yelling at one another. Like if we were all, you know, like in a town square or whatever, not to use like the hackiest metaphor or whatever, but like if we were all in a town square fighting about this, it would be a nightmare, right? And like that, therefore, Twitter is kind of a nightmare. But like physically those spaces don't really exist. Yeah, I wondered, you know, I talked to um, Ian Bogost last week about Twitter specifically. And, you know, his theory is we're all just not meant to talk to this many people at once or hear this many people at once. And there are, especially on Twitter, specific functions of the platform that make this kind of pylon easy. Like imagine if you didn't have the quote tweet, right? Like a lot of the, a lot of the craziness is in the replies for sure, but there's a lot of quote tweet stuff going on. Yeah. And the quote tweet is like the best way to virtue signal something like, because you're not just replying to the person, you're replying to like, your people about how you would respond to this person. And you're like blasting it out to everyone that follows you. Therefore, yeah. like you get, you know, you, you get points based off of your reaction to something else. And so obviously we get rewarded for reacting to these kind of things that don't necessarily need to be reacted to, but are, you know, there's a human instinct in us to, to dunk on people. So Offline is brought to you by SecFi. I think we can agree that we have enough going on with our day-to-day jobs without having to add financial planner to our resume. If you're a startup employee with stock options, you may be wondering what to do with them and how to maximize their value. In a rapidly changing world of startups, SecFi helps answer questions like, what happens to your equity if your company gets acquired or is about to go public? Should you exercise your stock options? And if so, when? How should you pay for stock options? And how can you minimize your tax bill? SecFi's financial advisors specialize in aligning your stock options with your financial goals and are here to help protect and grow your money over time. Plus, SecFi's leading equity platform has already helped thousands of startup employees plan around their stock options. Offline listeners can get a free stock option planning consultation and a $400 discount on financial advisory services by going to www.secfi.com offline. So visit SecFi today to make sure you're making the most of your equity and stock options. That's www.secfi.com slash offline. Offline is brought to you by AG1. What if I told you you can get 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens in a single scoop of mythical green powder? Well, fantasy can become reality with AG1. I've been on it for, for months. I love it. Doesn't taste like it's super healthy. We're not endorsing a shot of wheatgrass. It's got this mild tropical taste you're actually going to look forward to every day. Uh, When you don't want the jitteriness of coffee but still want that same mental clarity and alertness, you're going to want to reach for your jar of AG1. Recommended by professional athletes with over 7,000 five-star reviews, this is high nutritional value in its most convenient format. Health potions and power-ups don't exist in real life, but AG1 feels as close as you can get. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash crooked. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash crooked to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Why do you think so much of this chronically online discourse uses sort of the language of social justice to shame people? Because it does seem like that's where... That those are the ones that really go viral, at least um, as I've seen. Um, and it's it's like you know suddenly we're debating whether Anne Frank had white privilege, and you're just like, what the <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> which was another, which was another real one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like what social media has done is really allowed people to understand how the world is extremely racist and ableist and sexist and and yeah. classist, and like that has been such a powerful force of progressive democracy, I would argue. But at the same time, you know, 
when, when you're used to having these conversations that can kind of be shut down by like, you know, identity politics or something like that, where it's like, I could never be wrong because I'm a woman or I can never be wrong because whatever. Um, you get the sort of like the bastardization of that kind of conversation when, you know, you're looking for reasons why you alone are the moral arbiter of this conversation. Um, and that can get really messy when you have people from different sides of, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just like a constant give and take between like what is acceptable in debate and what isn't. And that's just always going to be there. But I think that there's this moment of, you know, you get brownie points for moral judgment on other people in like this kind of space. And so it incentivizes people to find the thing that makes that person morally suspect and weaponize it against them. Yeah. And it's fraught, too, because you don't ever want to dismiss accusations of right. racism or ableism or elitism like out of hand. Mm-hmm. And so these things sort of take on a life of their own because everyone else is watching it and you're like, well, I don't want to jump in and just automatically, you know, yeah. say just automatically that that person is is uh, out of line there. So you yeah. just kind of like watch it, um, watch it get out of control, which is like brings me to the next point. I mean, there, there's another level of online discourse where the even larger group of people jump in to mock the angry replies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I have absolutely been guilty of this myself. Mm-hmm, um, same. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, but I never really feel great after I do it, you know? And yeah. I do wonder if, like, and I sometimes worry about this, if, like, highlighting these bad tweets from a few random strangers just, like, ends up fueling the argument you hear from a lot of right-wing pundits that like half the country is too woke. Yeah. How, how do you, how do you think about that? <laughs> no, I think that's like such a, a cru a crucial point here because it's so, so hard to talk or write about these things without coming across as some like woke culture has gone too far. And like, right. you know, the, <laughs> it's, it's PC, whatever, you know, uh, <laughs> and I never, ever want to do that. Um, but you know, it's not nothing, (laughs) you know, like there is, you know, using the, I think using the language of social justice activism is, you know, it, it, to, to, to kind of defend something that I wouldn't argue is rightful. Like it it doesn't like demand this like seriousness of social justice, like language. Um, But I, my argument would be that it kind of like weakens actual social justice activism. Whereas I think a conservative's yeah. argument would, would be like, that just means it's all crap and we shouldn't have to listen to them. And so I, I think, I think people on, people are coming at it from two sides and we both find these people kind of annoying, but for different reasons or for, or at least to like achieve different ends. Um, so I, I try to, you know, make that clear, but yeah, it's, it's, at a certain point, it's like, okay, you're dunking on a disabled person who's really angry about something that they perceive to be ableist. It's like, is this my fight? Not really. It's like, I don't need to, you know, however, however many times I've been yelled at on Twitter for being quote unquote ableist. It's like, I have no desire to dunk on those people further because A, I don't really want to get people to be angry at me, but also just because like, you know, they're, I do have a privilege over them of being a non-disabled person. It's like, it's, you know, it's, it's not, not worth to punch down, you know? Right. Well, and and then there's the question, is this tweet just an individual tweet opinion from one person who, as we said, may be going through something or is this indicative of a larger set of beliefs that's out there? Yeah. And a lot of times I think, Social media, especially Twitter, sort of obscures whether that opinion is representative of something larger or yes. just a single opinion. <laughs> and if it's a single opinion, then it's like, what are we really wasting our time on? Yeah, it, exactly. And I think like to any the reason that these conversations are called chronically online is because they're not mainstream. They are extremely <laughs> centered to these platforms where these things are incentivized. And so, yeah, like this is for the most part, when someone calls me, whatever, it's like, I know that this is a really small sliver of the population who, you know, is not representative of what most people actually think when they're reading something. And I think like that, that kind of warped sense of other people's reactions to our work or our posts is doing nothing good for discourse. (laughs) (laughs) I always think about this tweet 
that uh, you know Twitter is ninety percent someone imagining a guy tricking themselves <laughs> into believing that guy exists and then getting mad about it. Yeah. Now, this is these are a little different because these are actual examples, but there is this tendency, and I think it's on both the left and the right, and, yeah. and just all across the political spectrum, to just go online, whether it's on Twitter or some other platform, and really want to get angry. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> and you're sort of like looking for reasons to get angry, and a lot of times these. These tweets, these chronically online tweets, like give us somewhere safe to land. We're like, oh, we can all be <laughs> yes. angry about this now. It's like, yeah. why do we want to be that angry? I, don't- <laughs> I know. And, and I think like, you know, there's a really good piece on this from the writer uh, P.E. Moskowitz uh, where it, it's called Fuck Puritanism. And it's sort of about like the Marxist theory that like as things get materially worse, we become more sensitive to like moral transgressions and want to like hmm. be the – be the arbiter of what's okay to say or do or be and what isn't. And I think like people who are, you know, not feel, feel out of control in their finances or in their life in any other ways, because like, obviously society is insane right now. Um, like they, they latch onto things that they can, you know, feel okay about, which is like, I am a good person. I know I'm right. But, and by saying that you are wrong, that makes me feel better. Um, yeah. And I think that really has a lot to do with the type of guy syndrome where it's like, I bet there's someone who's mad at me for enjoying this walk right now. And like, there probably is. But like thinking about that person isn't helping anybody. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I have a theory that like, in, not really an, an innovative theory, but that the pandemic made all this worse because we were all like oh, yeah. trapped at home and people were feeling a little lonely. And then the world that you come in contact with every day is just all of these people yelling at everyone else. And yeah. that becomes contagious. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So I think like this story that I wrote, you know, last week, it's a continuation of a story I wrote in at the end of 2020, where which was called like the year in bad posts, because everything that year was just like shoved online really, really quickly. Yeah. And we had to kind of relitigate what is acceptable to do on the internet now that so many of us were here. And that was kind of like the be all end all of our connection with people. Uh, and so we got like, you know, the, the black squares to, to you know, to, to say yeah. that we're good white people. And, you know, <laughs> like you get the, the apologies from brands that are just like in these cutesy aesthetics, you get like those infographics that are adorable, but have misinformation in them. Uh, and you get these same kind of chronically online discourses. It was like, is infinite just a sign that your man is terrible? It's like, Oh my God, <laughs> it's a great book. <laughs> Sorry. That's my pet. Uh, pet topic. <laughs> <laughs> we all have them. We all have them. <laughs> Offline is brought to you by Fume. Be smart. Don't start. Kick the habit. Put it out before it puts you out. All phrases we've heard a hundred times, yet we still continue to have bad habits. Our sponsor, Fume, is on a mission to accelerate humanity's breakup from the bad habits that consume far too many of us. Fume is a natural diffusive device that uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade out your negative habit for a positive one. Fume is not a vape. It's a non-electronic device designed to transform your negative habits. Instead of pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals, like a vape, Fume uses cores infused with plants like peppermint and cinnamon for delicious natural flavors. Fume's new version 2 model is snappy and tactile. With an adjustable airflow dial and a magnetic end cap, your fingers will always have something to always do. I didn't expect much out of Fume when I got it. Here it goes. But the minty sensation is really powerful and really hits the back of the throat. I'm sorry, just catch it. What? (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. Okay. Just Just keep going. I'm just, that's that's my personal testimony. Uh Uh-huh. So it was powerful and hit the back of the throat. Hit the back of the, it really hit the back of the throat. This is what I want people to know. The easiest way to stop a bad habit is to switch to a positive one. And Fume is designed perfectly to do just that. It's Fume's goal to make switching easy and even enjoyable. Mm -hmm. They got thousands of five-star reviews from people just like you who've successfully switched when other solutions just didn't work. Head to tryfume.com and use code CROOKED to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. The Journey Pack comes with three unique flavors. and Sounds like you've been on quite a journey. And the the new version 2 Fume to help kickstart your positive habits. That's tryfume.com and use code CROOKED to save an additional 10% off on your order today. 
We talked a lot about Twitter, and this is a, a problem that is, you know, special to Twitter. But you've seen this on TikTok too, right? You yeah. were just saying, and like, is there any difference in the type of online discourse you get there, and and does or on Tumblr, and and does this happen on other platforms? Yeah, I would say that you know, Twitter's user base is a, quite a bit older on on average than TikTok, and obviously TikTok isn't just you know young people, but you do get a lot more responses from people who you know, were maybe like raised on Tumblr and now they're on TikTok uh, without maybe ever having gone to Twitter at all. Uh, mm. And so you get you get a lot of like, I mean, this is maybe just like my, what my TikTok shows me, but it's just a lot of like young women discourse that is kind of like, is Lana Del Rey a feminist? Like, But like, they're not actually like that, but they sort of boil down to these kind of things. It's very heavy on, you know, feminism, body image, womanhood lifestyle things like that because it's it's so much more visual than than twitter mm -hmm. so i think you get a lot more discussion of aesthetics and presentation as you would on twitter which i would argue is more about like ideas and like philosophy um Interesting. yeah and I think it didn't, didn't West Elm Caleb start on TikTok? It sure that? did. Um, <laughs> so yeah, somehow that happened this year in January. Uh, a girl on TikTok was just like, she was, you know, made a little TikTok about how this guy that she had a good date with ghosted her. And then she said, I think she said his name. And then someone in the comments was like, oh my God, like, I think I went out with that guy too. And they all like, you know, made a couple of videos just being like, yeah, he sucks, like whatever. Uh, and then it kind of spiraled out of control. <laughs> and I don't think it was really the fault of the original women. It was just like people kind of projecting their own type of guy syndrome onto this guy who turned into like West Elm Caleb because he worked at West Elm. Uh, <laughs> and th then he then he became like the worst, like the most hated man on the Internet just because he like, you know, ghosted and sent a dick pic. And it's like. Okay, have you ever dated in New York, honey? Like, this is, this is what it is. <laughs> no, it's, you know, lest, lest we think Twitter is the only bad platform right, right. or the only platform where something like this can happen. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you, can get, you can get that kind of mob everywhere. <laughs> um, uh, you end up concluding in the piece that, that these reactions are now so common and so predictable that they've actually become pretty boring. Yeah. Do you have any hope that chronically online discourse may get so boring that we all eventually move on from it? I do actually. Like that is something that I think is a positive thing because like there are a lot of things that, you know, would have been such bigger deals had they happened like 10 years ago. Like, you know, when something went viral 10 years ago, it was like Rebecca Black uh, Friday. That lasted mm -hmm. for months. And now that would have been like an afternoon, you know, like yeah. it would have been like kind of stuck to this like niche portion of TikTok or YouTube or whatever, people would have laughed at it. It would have been over. And I think the same thing can be said for these kind of discourses. Like, you know, half of these things and I'm online all the time, like I didn't even hear about them until people dropped them in the, in the tweet. And so I think like, because they happen so often, they'll become just kind of irrelevant the way that they should be really, which is like, you know, a, a tiny, tiny percentage of people can read something in the complete like opposite way that it's meant to be read. And that becomes its own conversation. But it, I think it'll just be increasingly like shunted to the side where it belongs. <laughs> yeah. And because we've got to hit a saturation point, at right. some, uh, which I feels like we're hitting. Um, yeah. Speaking of moving on, how are you feeling about, uh, Elon's Twitter these days. Are you are you getting ready to leave, or or, or do you plan to, uh, in the words of one chronically online tweet, stand your ground like a Ukrainian? <laughs> oh no! Yes, so good, excellent that tweet. Was, <laughs> that was that was unbelievable. I'm like that person has spent too much time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. Like I actually have probably tweeted more maybe, but I think I go on it less. I, I really haven't seen any of the bugs that people have complained about, or I, I ha I've seen an uptick in like sk spammy DMs, but nothing like heinous or, you know, not an uptick in harassment or anything like that. To me, it's kind of just Twitter, but messier. Um, and yeah, I, I'll, I'll continue being there and probably until my, you know, hands fall off and I can't, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's fine. I think it'll just like become increasingly irrelevant. I don't think it's gonna like blow up one day, but yeah. It'll, yeah, I've, yeah, I don't think it's gonna blow up. I I, f I will probably be one of the people uh, turning the lights off there. Um, and mm -hmm. I also haven't noticed. 
Like the only thing I've noticed that's changed is that the the main character is Elon now. Yeah, yeah totally. And who's like who's somehow turning out to be an even worse main character than Trump was. I know. <laughs> like, like Trump was a much more dangerous figure since he was president yeah. of the United States and like, you know, had the new codes. But Elon Musk is like both annoying and boring and yeah. like, what are we all talking about this guy all day long for? I know. He's just like turned into like a like a reactionary conservative and it's like, okay, find another place. But I do think that like at the same time, it is kind of funny to see the Elon heads or like former Elon heads start to realize that like, oh, this guy is a psycho. Like yeah. <laughs> he's a nut and he should not be a billionaire or in charge of anything much less, you know, something like Twitter or a car company or a ro- or rocket company. <laughs> he is chronically online. He is. He is he is he is a chronically un- a chronically online person who is clearly going through something. <laughs> yeah, and like <laughs> I, but I I do not have empathy for him. That's like that's no, one guy that I feel. No, not zero empathy. <laughs> no, he is he but he is like the, exactly this type of person. The only difference is he's like one of the richest people in the world yeah. and now owns the fucking platform. Yeah. Um I read that you uh, didn't grow up online, that you were introduced to internet culture as an adult. <laughs> what did you see that made you want to write about it instead of like, you know, moving off the grid and getting a burner phone? <laughs> uh, well, I think the the truth is, is that like, you know, as someone who I've written since I was like five, like little stories, whatever. And, you know, a lot of writing is just about like human observation. And there's no better place to observe humanity than on the Internet where you don't even have to leave your house. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's part of it. And like you just see the breadth of the human experience uh, online in a way that yeah you you can't necessarily do in real life you're you're kind of you're you're um, fenced in by your immediate surroundings so yeah yeah no I I hear that I feel like you know I I was like a, a soch major in in college <laughs> and I feel like there is no better window into uh, all of the upsides and mostly downsides yeah. of, of humanity than studying people's behavior. Online. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, Rebecca Jennings, thank you so much for joining Offline. Uh, fantastic piece, everyone. Uh, go check it out and uh, and check out that that thread as well. It's, uh, <laughs> it'll uh, it, it's it's both uh, infuriating but mainly enjoying and uh, enjoyable. Yeah. And uh, and I had a lot of fun reading it. So. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. 